We should be broadcasting. Let me see here. Yes, we are. We're live. How are you doing today? I am excellent. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Michael Lafito here, everybody, on this Memorial Day. And I have a good friend of mine that I just actually met a few months ago before uh, COVID-19. And we were doing some traveling and conferences. So we, uh, we ran into each other at the Realty 2020 conference up in uh, Niagara Falls. That was that was a great conference. That was, and who knew that would be the last conference for a little while? I certainly didn't at that point. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, definitely. I, I actually was in Mexico a couple weeks after that, while everything was going down, and that was uh, that was definitely interesting. So we're on our twentieth episode. We launched this on April tenth uh, because of COVID nineteen, and we're having uh, various individuals such as yourself, and you coach some top real estate teams. So interesting, interested to get your perspective on, um, you know, how are some of the top teams adapting and mm -hmm. uh, pivoting, if you will, and, 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 and that sort of thing. But before we go into that, just a reminder, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, we're bringing this to you live on the holiday edition. Um, Memorial Day is not really a holiday, it's more of a remembrance. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, really excited to to be here with us, uh, have you with us today, and um, we have some exciting guests. Everybody can go to luxurylunchandlearn.com for, uh, to register and to see who's in the pipeline for our next five or six guests, and uh, we have some pretty powerful ones, and you can always go to our Facebook group, which is Luxury Listing Specials, to get replays of previous guests, or you can go to our Facebook page. So let's get right into things. Uh, Kathleen, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, where you're based and uh, kind of what, what your specialty is, if you, you could do it better than I could. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're based, our business is based uh, just outside of Toronto. We're in Oshawa, which is, um, a, well, it's its own city, but it's kind of a suburb of Toronto. But our business, yeah. uh, we work with people all across North America, um, and we work with people with online components uh, globally, actually. So uh, our business is focused on working with essentially entrepreneurial minds, right? Because we work in the team space. So the team space definitely is an entrepreneurial endeavor, in my opinion. Um, so we don't only work with real estate, but we predominantly do. So we're working with people who, you know, were busy, had really successful lives. I always say, you know, they all relate to the rushing home to dinner, being late, and then, you know, still feeling ashamed because they're on their phone or they have to run out and they're going, I have this business that I always dreamed of. And, you know, I am relatively stunningly successful, but I don't have time and I'm not doing any of the things I dreamed about when I built the business. So that's one side of what we do. We've worked with a lot of people who felt that way to the point where they said, I'll leave, like, if I can't fix this, I'll leave real estate. You know, like I'll take a pay cut. Like I cannot sustain and don't want to sustain um, this lifestyle. And the other um, facets are we also work with existing, you know, mega teams, top teams who want to make shifts. They want to be more efficient, productive, or profitable, which is our mandate on top of performance cultures. And lately, the last couple of years is individual agents who want to grow the same thing very efficiently. They want to be strategic. They don't want one-off solutions that they use for a couple of months and feel great. And then they go to a new conference. They want a cohesive plan. And we've had, we've loved working with those people because we take team systems mentality and we put it into the individual agents uh, business. And, you know, we've had multiple people double, triple, which is great, but I mean, they're, they're in the mind, mindset to implement what most of our industry does not want to do or isn't looking to do. Right. So they're having uh, great results there. So that's a little bit about our company. We run ultimate team summit and ultimate hundred deal plus mastermind. So yeah, we have a lot of fun. We work with great people. So you talked about events, obviously, um, with COVID-19, but that, that's going to change a little bit. But you, you do run a big uh, conference every year, right? And, and then you have these little masterminds, invite only. Yeah, in ma the 100 Deal Plus Mastermind, we actually do vet them. So if you're not a client with us and we haven't already seen, you know, personally seen your production, you actually apply, you submit that because there's a lot of events that, you know, claim and, and, and here nor there, right? But it's like a leap. But we got a lot of feedback from our clients saying, we want to be with other people that we can learn from. I mean, hey, I might have a team that does 500 or 600 deals a year and they have a team that does 300, but maybe they're strong in an area we're not. 
you know, it's not an ego focus, but it is saying you look at your business differently when you're a hundred deal plus team. And then when you hit a 300 deal plus, you look at it differently again, 500, you know, it's, it's like any small business, you're going to have different levels. And they really wanted that chance to say, we want to know who's in the room um, as in, and share openly. Like they shared their production levels, their GCI. Some of them shared like profit percentages, their mentality, their, their strengths, their weaknesses. Like it's, it's a really beautiful and unique uh, setting um, that particular event. Uh, That's great. That's great. So here we are, uh, you know, end of May, 2020 a lot of people's business plans right they're, they're revamping them because sure. of COVID-19 and um, it's definitely put um, things in perspective as far as priorities and that mm-hmm. sort of thing but people still life is what drives real estate that's what I consistently tell agents that we coach and we consult it doesn't matter who the president is or what interest rates are I mean life is what drives real estate people are relocating people are getting married people unfortunately are getting divorced people you know during this shelter in place you know, realizing what's important in a house and they're maybe reprioritizing floor plans or what they really want. Um, and, and so talk to me a little bit about, you know, some of the teams and agents that you're coaching, you know, what are the, what are, what are you seeing and, and what are the agents that are being successful? Um, what are they doing to stay relevant and bring value during this, this slower time for, for, for many? Yeah, and, and and I was talking with the, actually today with uh, Virginia Mundine who runs Buzz Conference here. So, um, well, which has you know actually been globally attended, which has been really cool. But you know, yeah. I, I think in some ways there's two sides of a there's two sides of both of the ways I'm going to answer your question. I mean, there's two sides of a coin that I'm kind of in a bubble where again, 80% of our community are top 1% producers, the majority are top 10% of the top 1%. Right. So, right. I mean, they're not a lot of them are now, you know, productive, you know, even to the point where they're getting busy and they're seeing results um, through this time, they've been very adaptable. So there's two sides to that. I mean, I'm seeing a skewed version of reality because of what our network is. But on the other hand, I'm also seeing people who are adapting, who are leading, who are leaning in to support their people, despite what's going on, or maybe even more because of what's going on around us. So I think that that's one side of things. The other side is, you know, I know, we're in a crisis market, right? It's a health crisis, but it's a crisis market. And I think, you know, there's, there's this want to tell people just do this or say this or go out and do these three things today. But the reality is when our mindset is in fear, when I'm living in like the ego mind, which is fearful and it's uncertain, I don't trust my guides. I don't trust advice. I don't trust my coaches. I don't trust the podcast. I just want to shelter literally mentally in place just as much as physically in place. And, you know, it can seem so easy to say, tell them to do, you know, this, this, this. But when somebody's in a mentality where they're uncertain, they're frozen, um, they're skeptical, the next step isn't do these three things, right? The next step is loosen up the mindset to get them into leadership, to get them focused on things where they can be confident, they can make a difference, then give them those things to do. Um, so we've worked really hard to look at mindset and how can we self, not diagnose, but how can we be self-aware of if I'm in a responsive, strategic, objective mindset, or if I'm in, again, you know, fearful, reactive um, because when I focus on what I can't control, it, it is, it's overwhelming. It's completely overwhelming for anybody. That's all of us. It's just, I don't think leaders focus on that. So you can call them delusional or you can call them, you know, uh, choosing to uh, chart a new course, right? With yeah. what they have. Yeah. So that's a good point, by the way, really good point, because, you know, we talk about fight, flight, and then the other would be freeze, right? I mean, those, my wife talks about that, you know, even with our kids, you know, everybody adapts to stress, stressors, change differently, um, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. But if they're not in a, in a, in a mental state, right, where they need, where, when I say they, it could be an entrepreneur, it's not even a real estate yeah. agent, it could be a home seller, home buyer, it could be anybody. Mm-hmm. But, but when they, they're, they're, you know, their, their mindset isn't right doesn't matter what you're going to tell them or teach them or show them they're they're not they're not in a place to absorb and and learn is that is that fair to say well yeah they're not focused on a place where they can see it's worth like we absorb and learn when we're motivated to accomplish something and if i feel like no matter what i do i don't know what the future holds and i can't have a positive uh, effect on anything that i'm doing with my actions then 
you know, why, why am I going to do anything? I'm just going to chill out. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us have equal capability to go in both directions. Um, you know, maybe some leaders have been forged in fire and they've been through things and they're like, no matter what, I'm going to focus on what I can control. Cause end of the day, if I have to rebuild, I have to rebuild. So I might as well be positive about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, I know you work with uh, American based real estate agents and Canadian based, um, but talk to us a little bit about Canada specifically, um, you know, pre COVID-19 and, and uh, during COVID-19, what, what are you seeing as far as activity showings? Um, is real estate essential up there? Uh, talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit specifically about that, that Canadian market, please. Yeah, for sure. So it's similar to US, whereas you have states, we have provinces. So, you know, it was mandated by the different provinces if they were in a state of emergency, who was essential, who was not. Um, in Ontario, which, you know, Ontario has the Toronto Real Estate Board. And just to put that into perspective, that's the largest board uh, in all of North America. So we have over 60,000, I think it's over 64, 63,000 agents at this point. So there's a lot of business being done there. Um, in Ontario, we were deemed essential, but but there was difficulty because of course the boards um, you know there there were areas where they can mandate and areas where they cannot because we were deemed essential so we had a great divide and a lot of judgment um, within the industry which was really hard because if people are already unsure and frozen add on to it these two completely polar opposite mentalities one being hey, you know what, I'm just going to focus on my business. This is going to pass in a week or two. You guys are all overreacting. And the other polar opposite saying, we're in a pandemic. You shouldn't even be thinking about business, let alone talking about it and criticizing. Meanwhile, you have people in the middle going, what do I do? What's right? Where's my leadership? Where's my strategy? And they're just freezing even more because they're watching these people throw in, you know, you know sure. whatever sure. they're throwing at each other. So it was really interesting where, again, I feel, you know, the, a lot of the, um, I think we had a lot of great leaders start to go, Hey, like we can be health conscious and we can focus on how we can be productive at home. I mean, we heard a lot of that from our U S clients of, yeah, we're remote. That doesn't mean we're shut down. Like we're still trying to be productive. We're still trying to reach out to people. We're still trying to be viable, you know, as an a value to the economy, which I think is really, really important. Um, in Quebec, initially, they were not deemed essential. It, in, you know, as we know, there's all sorts of other complications around closings, right. and you know, it's it's a, a domino effect, right? Yeah, it but really the, is. Yeah, I, I'm. I don't want to miss speak it but as far as i know across our client network i think and again i'm not 100 percent certain but that they were the only province who did not deem real estate essential in canada so for the bigger areas where we do a much higher volume of business um they they are adapting remote and you know if you had a client process it was a little bit easier to do that if you didn't this is a big wake-up call right okay yeah. And, and how are like showing so a lot many real estate yeah. agents use uh, showing time services so in other words mm -hmm. if an agent wants to show another house uh, they might not go through the agent they'll go through an app which yeah. will contact the owners and, and that sort of thing and sure. there's a, a large one here in the states called showing time and I believe they're in Canada as well and um, so you could break down like uh, let's say they're in 30 states here and Illinois, for example, mm -hmm. they're in in Illinois, and so I could do a drop down and determine how our showings doing compared to last year at this time. So mm -hmm. in Illinois, showings are down around ten percent versus last year at this time. But you know they're they were down fifty percent. Uh, I think March twenty March twenty fifth or sixth was when the valley was hit as far as mm -hmm. lack of showings in, in Illinois. And Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. I think, is down ninety percent because. They are not deemed essential. Uh, of course, New York is down. You know, I know there's different provinces, but overall, do you have any kind of um, inkling as, as, as far as what kind of activity are you seeing? You know, here we are during the prime season uh, mm -hmm. compared to maybe uh, last year at this time. Well, I th so a couple of things, like our clients are all throughout two countries. So I don't have the exact data for every single area that they, sure. they work within. You know, we work with clients with that um, directly on calls, but in general, I mean, I think even up to a week ago, week and a half ago, we were around Toronto, about half of our typical showings in that area. Okay. Um, okay. And it was, you know, definitely picking up. Our supply is, is low. Like we have, we were in a really um, on demand coming into a strong seller's market um, and have been for a couple of years for sure. So, I mean, 
mean, that demand was there. You've got buyers who have missed out on multiple offer after multiple offer saying, okay, is this our chance, you know, to get out there? But then you have sellers holding back. Like our supply just has not come on the market yet. So, you know, will it be a late uh, spring market? And we'll just kind of see that we're looking to cultivate as many opportunities have a rebound at that time, whereas other agents are waiting and seeing. So they're going to start the rebound when we're already in it is uh, our focus. But I, I think honestly, like it's, it depends where you're sitting again. Mm -hmm. Like if you're a heavy hitter, you might still be relatively busy right now. Like we have teams who did 30 deals last month. We have teams who did 12 and they're going, Hey, I bet on nothing. So I'm happy. Like we have people who have already done like 78% of their entire year on the buy side and 70% on the sell side. Right. So like we had a really strong start to the year across the board for the people yeah. that we're working with. So, you know, we had a little bit of a buffer because of that, but yeah. there, you know, we had the initial shock, but they've still been working really hard to be productive. Like we're hyper-focused on, um, phone contacts, buyer contracts, you know, uh, follow-ups with sellers, our hot lists right now. We're celebrating a different bullseye because we know from other market shifts that there'll be a delay, but we'll still see the, the fruits of some of that labor, right? So that allows us to stay confident. Well, that, that's, a, that's a, a good reminder, Kathleen, and we've had a couple other guests talk about that as well. You know, here we are, end of May, when, when, when shelter in place is removed for wherever, you know, whatever agent and whatever person watching this training is each mark is a little bit different, right? And each, uh, each prime season might be a little bit seasonally different for any market really. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, but putting in the work now, you know, the fruits of the labor sometimes are 30, 60, 90, 120 days down the road, right? It doesn't happen automatic, you know, automatically. So keeping in contact, communicating with, uh, you know, potential clients or past clients, um, is, is really important because I do feel, you know, especially in a lot of these larger cities uh, where perhaps like Chicago, where I'm based in the, the suburbs, but downtown Chicago, I mean, they have a really stringent shelter in place. And, and I do believe uh, families or those that are even single are realizing, man, I, I want to be able to freely move around it. And maybe the suburbs is, is, is a better answer for some of that. I was at a photo shoot actually about 45 minutes ago and beautiful outdoor pool. And in this particular area in the Chicago land market, you know, pools are, are really open for maybe five months at best, but really four months. But it's not necessarily a huge asset to sell a home with a pool. But I think during and post COVID-19, a pool is going to be a huge asset and it will be a nice, a nice benefit because public pools are closed and are going to be closed this summer. So, um, you know, are you seeing any type of trends uh, with some of the agents that you're talking to as well, as far as uh, floor plans or what's important, uh, perhaps uh, during and post COVID-19 more so than pre COVID-19 uh, as far as if I'm a homeowner thinking about buying a new place, what's, what's the priority now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think people are definitely um, talking about looking at space for work from home. I mean, more and more people are considering, you know, how long will we be working from home, um, which is, you know, everyone has a different guess. I talked to somebody yesterday who said, you know, we're, we're pretty sure we're not going back to January. Whereas other people have already been told they're going back sooner, you know, depending on the industry, right? So um, that aspect in outdoor spaces. But to be honest, I think, you know, um, because it's like the higher volume you do, the more it's mixed, right? What first time buyers is looking to get into the market in the seller's markets, whereas move up move might is more that, you know, I think even in my own home, I've said, you know, it, what's functional and what's not. And I had this need to be like, I don't even care what it looks like. I just like, it doesn't look bad, but you know, I want it to sure. be functional all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So like I'm here, I'm doing everything here. I need it to just work and have the space. So certainly we're hearing more still um, because our people are on the phones. Like, it's more, is there a confident reason to move forward and get educated now? Like, why should I entertain getting educated on a buy or sell right now versus hold off? Those people are getting them, them through a little bit more, but it's still the majority of that wait and see mentality. So I don't think people are, you know, the, the number of people are in the market have more urgent and immediate needs, but the rest of the people are still going, yeah, I'd kind of like this, but I don't know if this is a good time. So there's sure. a lot of nurturing happening there. So I don't think we've seen like one um, pattern for us across the network. It's been varied. Okay. Yeah. That's, it's good to know. In your opinion, I mean, you coach uh, some of those top teams and agents and, and maybe even when you get them, they're very successful, but you take them to that next level. But based on what you're seeing 
from North America, both Canada and the States, uh, those agents, those teams, those, those individual agents uh, that will be most successful, I guess, post COVID-19 uh, are those that have blank in common. What, what, what do you think they'll have in common, those that are successful? Uh, I think they will 100%, well, I've already seen it. I mean, those who are successful are looking for, they're focused on increasing efficiency and productivity now, for one thing. I'm not, I can't give you, I'm, one, they're objective and strategic. That would be the blanket statement, but there's so many things under that, right? Like they're focused on investments versus cost. They, they've been focused during this time of saying, hey, this is a gift. Like what can I, not a gift of the loss, of course, or the fear, sure. I would never, never say that, or, you know. Um, there's no disrespect or lack of reverence for what's happening, but no matter what happens in the outside world, I have a choice for what I do at that time. And I think some leaders have small kids at home and they don't have as much time and some people don't have as many resources. So they're super focused and worried about costs and, and financial stress. So I think leaders coming out of this are going to be more, if they were not already, hyper-focused on their economic model, their financial model, what's working, what you know, tracking what's working, but they're looking for solutions they're looking for opportunities they're always there you know they're always always there and people can say like how can you confidently act when things are so uncertain it's like well i know where i want to go i know what direction that is so i'm going to make the choices now that give me the best chance of getting there and i think any leader you know when you look at the research for the businesses that survived in the u.s after the last um you know, crash that you guys went through and they looked at the percentages of the businesses that survive if they were getting offensive or defensive, right? So the ones who actually pushed out into the market more versus kind of sheltered and pulled back, they were a little bit more, but not a ton. It was like 65%. But the key to this was there was, there was more value in the question than there actually was in the answer because every one of the businesses that they looked at who were small businesses and were able to survive and do well, they all strategically chose based on my business. Do I need to get su you know, super strong at putting my message into the market or do I need to get lean and mean and shelter in place? Both of them were highly strategic and they took action, right? That was the key. They didn't kind of just let whatever happened happen and have it be a wave over them. And I think that's, that's our successful leaders moving forward. Uh, that's, that's a great point. So looking at your business model, looking at, you know, everything about your business from overhead to employees to what's my exp expenditures you know whether it be on marketing and branding and you know all of the above and either you know based on where your business is and where you want to go but but assessing it and tweaking it either making it larger and putting up you know adapting right like the pie chart shifting percentages of where things are going mm -hmm. uh, and what you're focusing more on or or maybe adapting and and pulling back on certain things that that might not uh, make sense at this time well for sure and i mean i think you know some of us were uh, either blessed or not blessed depending how you look at it but when you're in such a strong healthy market and you're going it costs me more to slow down and assess what i should ca cut with these little costs than it does because these opportunities are flowing in so the teams are businesses producers teams that now take this time to say wait a minute I, maybe I won't have the privilege to not have to worry about everything converting as well. Like I was able to be somewhat like gluttonous, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. So taking this time now, maybe I'll be in just as strong of a market after, but now I will be leaner. I will be more aware. And I won't maybe take that, uh, like for myself, because I came out of building a business with a t like a ton of debt and turning that around, I never knew anything other than being careful and, and efficient, but that was such a gift because I could have never built my business without of it, without it. So I think the leaders going through this will realize they actually have more resources to grow than they, than they thought, right? This time may be an incredible gift for, for many, many people who lean into it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, even as we looked in our business, we really wanted to bring value during this unprecedented time to agents and, and we've done tons of free trainings, free trainings. And mm -hmm. uh, actually tomorrow we're doing a uh, online luxury designation training. Um, yeah. And I was hesitant to even offer it just because, you know, I thought, well, hey, during this time, people are going to be cutting finances, but we actually got feedback saying, Hey, this is the time where we want to, we, we want to, you know, focus and we have some time to, to dedicate to your designation. And so we're, Kathleen, we're doing it, you know, our online training uh, tomorrow. And then in, in about four weeks from tomorrow, we're actually going to do a big global 
uh, luxury designation training and we're really excited to have a lot of people that are on board and uh, it's going to be really exciting but my, even if you will I was hypersensitive to the fact that I, I know people are you know watching their budgets and so forth but it's supply and demand there was a demand there that I didn't even think would be but people are saying no we want to take this you know please one of your next classes so um, sure. there, there we have it so yeah, they have the time now. And I think, again, like I, 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 and just, you know, to your point, if they take this now and it allows them to be stronger for years and years to come, I mean, that's a fantastic yeah. investment. And I had a team leader say to me that he took the time to slow down and totally organize all his plans. Like they do consistently 200 deals plus per year, but all the plans in the CRM. And he said, you know, I'm almost giddy. I almost feel guilty because I would have never taken this time. And literally we will be able to do 10 times more business after. He said, not because we couldn't have, you know, potentially before, but doing the amount of business they were, the way they were doing it was so chaotic and hectic. He's like, I couldn't have even considered doing more than that. Now we'll do that. It'll feel like a breeze, but I would have, he said, I would have never taken the time to do it though, right. to the extent we did now. Right. So that's, yeah. you know, similar to, to thinking, I'm sure with the workshops you're providing or designations. Yeah, no, you're fine. So, um, all right. Talk to me a little bit about luxury. Um, you, what are your predictions post COVID-19? Uh, what do you, what are you seeing there? Is there going to be a higher desire for some of these, you know, higher end luxury properties for, you know, in, in, in the Ontario market, for example, uh, maybe a, a market that you have a better finger on the pulse. Do you feel like there's going to be a higher desirability for those types of properties or you think it's going to be more of a buyer's market? Um, well, Ontario has different cities. Like I, I would really be highly shocked to see us go into in Toronto to go into a buyer's market. The demand is just so strong, um, as well as the people coming into the market. I mean, it's just, it, there's, there's a huge demand to be in the city. So, you know, the only way we could go into a buyer's market is if, you know, we have, I think in several months, the after effects of layoffs that turn into, you know, uh, people not being brought back after the relief is not pouring into the economy that's coming from the federal government right now. I mean, we don't know the ripple effect to that yet. Mm -hmm. But right now, I, I would highly suspect from the numbers and the tracking and what we're seeing across our teams that we will experience a late spring and we will have quite a strong open up to the market. But then we don't, you know, who, who knows? We're going to have to wait and see the ripple effect for how it settles. I mean, Typically for us with the teams we work with, and again, our, our clientele that we see data for, and overall, I mean, the luxury, usually if there's a hit, they hit a lot harder, right? Because, you know, 10% on um, a $600,000 home is very different than a multi-million dollar home. Mm -hmm. um, so typically in our market, when there is an adjustment, yes, the luxury is hit harder and for a little bit longer until the confidence swings back up with the move up moves and then obviously people move in back into those properties. So um, we don't only specialize in luxury, but we have several teams that do. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly, you know, whenever there's a wait and see mentality, people are going to wait and see more about bigger uh, purchase uh, items, right? Bigger ticket items. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. And and in your opinion, based on, you know, North America, the, uh, 2007, 2008, you know, there was that, uh, economic downturn, if you will. Um, I don't want to call this a, a downturn that we're in, but we're definitely in a unique time. How How is 2007 and 8, in your opinion, different than what we're going through now, housing-wise? Sure. I mean, first of all, I mean, that was an economic crisis. As we know, this is a health crisis. So we'll, but, you know, <laughs> we'll see what it does to the economic side after. I mean, I'm not pretending to ignore that fact. Um, but in Canada, I mean, the, the 2007 to, it was more for us spring 2008 until 2009, if I'm remembering correctly. I hope I'm not adjusting that. No, it was. Yeah. For us, it was very, very around uh, Toronto area. Anyways, that was the time period. Um, and uh, I mean, I think it was, again, a little bit different because we were facing, you know, again, uncertainty in the market. But for us, it picked right up a year later because the demand was just still so strong. So um, at that time, I mean, we weren't in as strong of a seller's market as we are today. So I don't know if there's anything. I don't know if there's anything. Um, that I would say is the same, except for the mentality of how we need to approach it if we have an adjustment. Like I'm more a focus on market facilitator than market maker. Like I wanna know the stats and I wanna support our people to know the stats, but end of the day, like in 2008 to 2009, I mean, there were sellers that I sat down in front of them like, 
10 times. There are probably people watching this who go, I had sellers I sat down in front of 30 times, right? Who, you know, they were trying to chase down a declining market and they were just too unsure to do what they needed to do. And we got really strong. Like we got into predetermined price reductions and systems that I still use today. So if we adjust like we did at that time, we're going to shift the systems we focus on, but we already have them. We've already trained on them. We we're, that's how we're able to be agile as teams because we already know our buyer systems, sell, our seller's market, buyer's market, mixed market um, approaches. We just need to shift mindset in uh-huh. order to lean in and go. Uh-huh. And, and that's how we do that. So overall, I, I mean, we've had a few different experts on and, and trying to kind of draw parallels, but ours was more of a ripple effect from the U.S. changes than it was actually a Canadian uh, economic situation that happened for us in 2008. So it was definitely different for us. Okay. All right. Good to know. Uh, Again, uh, for those of you that are watching on the live stream in one of the various Facebook groups or on the Zoom, if you have any questions for Kathleen or myself, go ahead and just chat those in. My assistant uh, checks those. And uh, if you ask that question on a replay of the live stream or uh, in another matter, uh, I'll personally get back to you. Uh, My email uh, is michael at marketingluxurygroup.com, michael at marketingluxurygroup.com. And uh, Kathleen, um, before I open it up for some questions as well, um, what's the best way for somebody to get a hold of you um, if, if they have a question and they want more information on you and your company? For sure. Um, you can follow us. If you go to Instagram, you go Kathleen Black Coaching. There's two. Kathleen Black Personal is mine, but Kathleen Black Coaching. Our website is ittakes.team. It takes a dot team. Um, I recently released a book as well, and I don't know if you share links after, uh, Michael, but I'm more than happy. Yeah, it's top1percentlife.com, which the one is numerical, and you can get a free digital download. It's going to be in bookstores January 2021. I'm told still on track, but we shall see, you know, life is what it is. Um, Yeah, but it's kind of that journey of expansion that we work with. So if anyone's watching this and looking to get some leverage, get some time back as they ramp back up, I'm more than happy for you guys to have a free copy. Oh, please. That's awesome. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me check here. We got any chat. We got any questions? Uh, again, let me just check here and I'm going to check my cell phone here because my assistant, as I mentioned, she texts me here. Um, Talk to me about, while I'm looking this up, talk to me about what does the seasonal market look like in the Toronto area, like typically, not t- not what we're experiencing now, but what's a typical seasonal selling season um, in Toronto? Well, it's somewhat influenced by the, the weather at times, because when you're talking about the pool season being, you know, three to four months, obviously we're similar uh, you know, to Chicago in that way. But typically we're, we're traditional spring market, um, fall market. Spring market is, is very strong for us. It's usually our longer market and, you know, where we aim to get a, a lot more of our transactions um, in place. But it just depends. I mean, some years our spring market is ramping up mid-March. Other years it's earlier. Um, if it's freezing and there's tons of snow, we find there's a little bit of a, a delay for sure. Um, and then we ramp back up definitely in September up until usually mid mid to early November uh, is okay. our typical height of our, our market uh, for sure. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of cottage country outside of Toronto, which would be obviously different because they're uh, seasonal. More spring is their big markets. Okay. Yeah. Very, very similar. Chicago is very seasonal. Um, uh, usually revolves around the school year. So it's springtime, people put their home on the market through summer. And many times people want to be settled in, you know, by the start of the school year. I do have a couple questions. Uh, first off, um, a couple shout outs. Um, and to everybody here, uh, Kathleen Black is amazing. She gives such great advice. Uh, Arizona never shuts down. Oh, thanks, Colleen. Appreciate that. Yes, thank <laughs> Fortunately. you. Um, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Dietrich says, um, what are your thoughts on funding a deal with cash versus debt, i.e. getting a mortgage um, in terms of the possibility of holding on to the asset in, in today's world? And how has the luxury market been affected compared to those losing their homes to foreclosure from what's happening currently? So um, I'll, I'll let you answer that first and then I'll answer. But again, just uh, what are your thoughts on funding a deal versus cash or getting a mortgage because rates are still cheap and keeping that liquid cash so you can make investments or do other things with it. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, obviously I, I'm not copying out of your question, but I think it really is personal depending on your uh, resources, right? Like personally as an investor, I mean, I wanted to be able to have as many, as much growth as I could. So I wasn't looking to put 100% down on a property. I was looking to be able to leverage and have multiple properties so I could have less uh, down, but have it in more properties that have multi-units. So they're a little bit more secure. Uh, personally, that's what my sweet spot is that I really love. Um, but you know, we also like, we came out of, uh, personally a time of investing where we had us, no money down. We had those companies go bankrupt and sell our debt to other people and things like that. So I think we had a very different experience of it here, to be honest, and our banking system's a little bit different. I mean, they say it's much, you know, it's, it's a little bit more, um, conservative, how we look at lending and, and, uh, what we've done in Canada long term. Like we had a very short period where we had a hundred percent financing and even our 5% down is quite stringent in comparison. So personally here, like the max, um, the minimum we can put down for an investment property, which I'm assuming is leading to your question, uh, is a 20% down without having high ratio insurance. So personally to me, if the market is going to take a bit of a dip and my goal is to expand my investment portfolio, I would prefer to put a 20% or 30% making sure I was confident because we don't know if, uh, how deep a dip is going to be. Um, you know, we had uh, multiple people on who have been through different market crashes, you know, been in the industry 35, 45 years, one of them. Mm -hmm. And one of their, their responses, actually, what they learned from that time was saying, hey, I went too aggressive. Like now I will not put myself in a position where even with a market correction, I wouldn't have enough equity in the property to cover it. Like that was a lesson because both of them went through losing yeah. properties, right? It was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So uh, without more information, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, if you have bags and bags of, of money all over the place, maybe you'll put it all down. But for, for growth, usually it's, it's a lower percentage. What are your thoughts on that, Michael? I feel like I'm giving a big answer to like a multiple scenario question. I don't know. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good answer right there. I, I would say, again, it's personal, right? Money is cheap right now. Interest rates are really cheap. So, um, you know, I'd rather, you know, I Again, I'm not a financial advisor. You talk with your consultant, you know, your financial advisor or someone on your staff. But, but personally, I, I think money's so cheap right now as far as interest rates. You know, um, it, it probably would make sense to, to, uh, you know, to to put a little bit less down. However, the market's so volatile as well as far as the stock market. You got to be careful there too. So, um, it really kind of depends on what your long-term plans are as far as luxury real estate's concerned. Um, you know, although they might be sheltered in certain ways, they're, they, they, they're hurting in other ways as well. A lot of business owners out there, you know, have a lot of employees that they're, they're, they're keeping, you know, on, on payroll during this time as well. So, um, you know, luxury is not necessarily sheltered. Um, it, you know, a lot of times they're exposed, they have more exposure as well. So I do think you're going to see um, some more properties come on the market in that upper end to liquidate some cash. Um, but again, it's all, it's all regional based. Mm -hmm. And I like that you, it, it, it's strategy again, it's so important because how deeply ingrained is it in that, like, just for example, I'm a single parent, like I have been for a long time when I got in real estate, I went through a separation. So I had to like basically become a breadwinner from not being one. So that's fine. But I always had this idea, um, you know, minimize your personal risk, which I still do. Like I keep my personal expenses very low so I can lean into educated risk in the business because I need that advantage. Otherwise mm -hmm. I'd be at a disadvantage legitimately. But a couple of years ago, I'd put myself reminders, you know, assess, paying down your mortgage versus, you know, buying another investment property. And I had something so deeply ingrained in me that kept saying, pay off the house, pay off the house, be mortgage free. So finally I just gave in to myself and I put, you know, a lump payment. I still very, almost, uh, it's almost paid off. But anyway, point in this is I went back and I was like, what the heck were you thinking? Like the mortgage percentage is so much lower, even than the line of credits. Like you, you like, there was absolutely no reason for that. It completely came from an old school scarcity mentality that sure. if I had to put on my agent hat, I never would have done, but it's so easy to get stuck in that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great point. That's a great point. Well, uh, let me see if there's any other questions. If not, I'll let everybody go on this, uh, this Memorial day here. Um, Are you giving any advice right now, Michael, on um, luxury specifically for hold versus sell mentality? Because I've heard a few different opinions. And if you don't have one, that's okay. I'm just curious. 
I mean, it, 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 luxury is so regionally based, right? I mean, we define luxury as three times the average sale price for that given market. So, you know, in many suburbs of Chicagoland, there's three, four, five plus years of inventory above certain price points, right? I, mm -hmm. And so uh, I, in markets of uncertainty, I, I, and somebody's thinking about selling, my advice would be sell and, and, and set the ceiling versus if you don't put your home on the market and a neighbor that's similar size and, and, and a comp, if you will, um, they, they might set the floor. You know, so in other words, they're gonna bring down values anyway. So if you're thinking about selling, you know, get all your ducks in a row, do the things you're supposed to to make you know, proper first impressions, but you wanna be the first to sell to set, set the ceiling because if your neighbor's more motivated, they have more equity, um, and they, they take a low ball offer, guess what? Your, your value might be brought down anyway. So you wanna set that ceiling if you really need to sell. It comes down to, I'm a one to 10, scale of one to 10 guy. So on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you want it sold yesterday, one being I don't care if it sells in three years, mm -hmm. you know, depending on a seller's motivation, if they're a nine or a 10, they really wanna sell, you know, then then let's let's, let's do the things that your competition isn't willing to do and let's hit the ground running and let's get it sold first to set the ceiling versus, you know, let them set the, the floor. Yeah. yeah. So important. Cause I think even, you know, their agents who are telling across the board luxury or not, you know, just wait, wait till the market's stronger later. It's like, but how do you know for sure the market's going to be stronger later? You, you don't. And it's interesting. Everyone in the luxury space has shared your, your thoughts on this. And I think it's really important. You know, if there's demand, again, there's micro areas, of course, sure. but if there's demand there, why, and, and you have it, why not express that to the sellers who do are motivated to move forward? I think often we, we get in the way of our business or we try to forecast, right? Which, yeah. You know, we don't have a crystal ball. So thank you for that. I, I just think yeah. it's a really important perspective. Yeah, nobody has that crystal ball. I mean, I have a, a property that we're putting in the private network, if you will, and it's going to be just under two million. But it's got an amazing indoor pool and outdoor sports court, and and I think there's going to be a higher desirability for that home today, based on what's on the market in this particular area, uh, versus you know perhaps in the future. Be, as I mentioned earlier, most public school uh, public schools, but public pools this summer are going to be closed. So that indoor pool for entertaining and having people over and and, and sanity maybe of the kids, I think there's going to be a lot more desire for that property today than there was a year ago and maybe in the future. So I'm encouraging them at least dip your toes in the water and let's put it in the private network and and see what kind of response we get. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter as you know what you think and I think the market dictates price right the market speaks and uh it doesn't matter what you have into the home or what you'd like to get out of it the market dictates price of course we take the statistical analysis of what's going on and what's sold and are there true comps uh, but at the end of the day appraisers are wrong too right appraisers are an opinion of value so um very very good uh good points there so Hey, um, got some very good compliments on you. Uh, great content. We'll get a copy of this recording to you. Uh, just a reminder for everybody that's watching, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, same time, same place, 1.30 Eastern, 12.30 Central, 10.30 on the West Coast, uh, Pacific time. Uh, about 45 minutes, we try to get content, 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 get different perspectives. And uh, we, we're having some folks on uh, this week that you'll be excited about. Uh, go to LuxuryLunchAndLearn.com or check us out on our Facebook page where we'll have replays of this. And if you are getting something for this, leave us a like, let somebody else know about it. And that's what we ask. We're donating our time and our energies to help raise the bar in real estate and make others day. So Kathleen, really appreciate what you're doing. As always, if we can help you with anything, let us know and keep raising the bar. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you to everybody who joined us. I appreciate it. I hope we'll get to see you in person someday soon. We shall I hope see so when. too. I hope so too. All right. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. Bye All for right. now. Bye.